Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I think we will get started. Uh, this session is being recorded, so you will be able to um, rewatch the session at a later date um, from the Educational Technology website, as well as um, our presenter will be providing a link to the presentation as well, so you can go through that. So thank you, everyone for attending our webinar this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to go through some housekeeping items before we start. My name is Gina Catanazzo, and I am the Educational Technology Committee, uh, ETC for short, representative for Humber College. The virtual Lunch and Learn webinar series is brought to you by the ETC Committee. The ETC is comprised of members from all 24 colleges in Ontario, Canada. The sharing of ideas, best practices, and teaching and learning strategies related to the use of technologies inside and outside of the classroom is a central characteristic of, of the committee and the inspiration for this webinar series. In addition to this webinar, we have three more coming up in the series. Do visit our website to sign up for more of our webinars. Our next webinar is Build Accessible Digital Experiences on November 18th at 11 a.m. Want to facilitate a webinar? We are now accepting volunteers for the winter 2021 term. To submit a proposal, visit our website to submit your idea. And last but not least, want to join our webinar mailing list? Stay informed about upcoming webinars each term, opportunities to facilitate webinars, and information about the Advancing Learning Conference, um, which is another thing that our committee um, organizes uh, usually every year. Visit the link um, on the screen, and I will also be pasting all the links that I talked about in our chat window as well. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Rob Terrio from Georgian College, and he will be facilitating our webinar today on integrating virtual reality in higher education. So over to you, Rob, I will stop sharing. Sure. Okay, hi everybody. Let me just uh, screen my share here, or screen my share, share my screen. <laughs> um, let's see. <clears throat> let's do that. Okay. Um, now, the awkward thing about this uh, screen sharing function within uh, Blackboard Collaborate is that um, I can no longer see the audience, so I can't see who the participants are, but I think we're we're expecting over 80 people today, which is great. So um, this session is gonna be on integrating immersive virtual reality in higher education. And um, just by way of background, uh, I have been a paramedic for 36 years <clears throat> and teaching for the last 20 years, uh, uh, the last 15 of which has been at, uh, 16 of which has been at Georgian College. And we, um, integrated virtual reality into our paramedic lab a couple of years ago, and VR has been integrated into our architectural technology program for the last uh, four years. Uh, but I want to tell you about my first uh, virtual reality experience, which really was the inspiration for exploring uh, immersive virtual reality for me. So I was at a conference in Washington, D.C. in 2016, and I was walking by an exhibitor booth, and they were showing some virtual reality. and um, um, there was a guy with a headset on and you could see what he was seeing on a TV screen, big TV screen, and it was an animated patient. And uh, uh, to be quite frank, it looked really underwhelming to me. It just looked like any other scenario that I'd seen on a, on a computer screen. And then I got to put the headset on and it was a, it was a wow experience for me. So I was standing in front of this animation, animated patient, not the one you're seeing on your screen, but one that was pretty similar. And he was sitting on the edge of his bed and he was struggling to breathe. And the first thing that struck me was that uh, I could hear him struggling to breathe. And 
I could ask him questions and he was only able to speak four or five words between taking a breath and I could see his shoulders heaving and I could see his lips were a little bluish from lack of oxygen. Um, and I could see that he was in quite a bit of distress. And then I could take a stethoscope and listen to his chest, just place it on, on the back of his chest and I could hear abnormal lung sounds. And I could walk over to his night table and pick up medications to see what he was on, which gave me uh, some greater insight into what his past medical history was. And I could hook him up to the monitor. I could start an intravenous line if I wanted to. And what struck me at the end of that experience was two things. Uh, one, when I reflected on it, I, I got that same twinge of adrenaline I get uh, on a paramedic call when I see someone who's really ill. And I that feeling that I need to assess and treat this guy as quickly as possible. The second thing that struck me was that when I think about my first year students who, um, you know, when we start to talk about case-based learning, when I start to present cases, they're looking at text on the screen, they're looking at maybe images, but they really have no context. They have no sense of what someone in uh, respiratory distress looks like. And I thought virtual reality would give them that context. And that really uh, drove me to start exploring uh, virtual virtual reality further. Um, now, if you haven't tried virtual reality, you're basically putting a head mounted display or a VR headset on your face and it completely blocks out your view of the outside world. And I think of it um, like the Chronicles of Narnia. So if you've seen this movie or read the book before, it's a fantasy novel where four children are evacuated to safety in an old English countryside home before the start of World War II. And uh, after exploring the, their new living quarters, Lucy, one of the four children, finds this enchanted wardrobe. And she steps inside the wardrobe and slowly walks between the rows of clothing. And when she reaches the back of the wardrobe, she opens this door and discovers the opening into a magical world of Narnia. And in virtual reality, when you don a, a VR headset, you look up, you look down, you look left, you look right, you turn completely around and you're in a completely and utterly different world. And that was, uh, that's, it's really truly a, a remarkable experience if you've never had it before. But the other thing that's really important in immersive virtual reality is that um, learning can happen in all of the three major domains, which I find quite remarkable. Uh, because in some programs, you have a great deal of agency where you can use your hands for things. So you can use your hands for construction or for surgery um, and there are a number of uh, virtual reality apps as well that that work in the effective where you experience uh, empathy through the experiences and i'll talk about those in a minute and then there's uh yep sorry were you gonna say sorry. yeah sorry rob i just wanted to let you know um your audio is cutting in and out I'm, I'm not sure if you're moving around or there, there was a period where you were really clear and and now yeah. you're fading in and out Okay, might, might be just a connection of my uh, my mic here. Let me just try plugging into another USB spot here. Sure. Is that any better? Uh, I'll let you know in a couple minutes. <laughs> Uh, I don't. Yeah, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, let me know if it becomes intermittent. I'm using headphones right now, but I'll just unplug the headphones and use my PC. I, well, to me already, it sounds sounds better, but but I'll let you know if it happens okay. again. Okay. Good. Uh, and I'm assuming everyone's seeing my full screen still, my slides. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yep. Uh, so, and lastly, um, there are virtual reality applications where. Um, you can develop your higher order thinking where you're um, uh, expected to assess and determine what's wrong with a particular situation, be it medical or otherwise, um, make an intervention, and ultimately that has a, a positive or negative outcome depending on uh, on what you're doing. Um, so some incredible potential 
uh, for immersive virtual reality. It's still early days. Uh, there, you know, is still a lack of content in a number of areas. Uh, but I've been exploring content since uh, since I started uh, a new position as immersive technology lead in January, and uh, we've launched a series of pilots at Georgian College. So I want to talk about those just to give you some insight into what we've done, and hopefully gives you some, some thoughts about what you might do at uh, your school, be it higher ed or uh, K to 12. So. Uh, before I do that, I want to talk briefly about um, some of the technology. So, um, cardboard VR with headsets uh, is pretty much being phased out, and it's it has its limitations. So, uh, limitations in the sense that you don't have controllers, so you don't have agency, you can't manipulate things. Uh, terribly easily. It uses um, gaze control for the most part. So if you want to activate a button, you just sort of stare at it and you'll see a circle spinning and then it becomes activated. But it's very limited in terms of um, higher education, but fine for th things like 360 videos. <clears throat> and in terms of um, other hardware, so you've got a, a choice essentially between standalone virtual reality headsets that don't require a connection to a computer or PC VR, which requires a connection to a computer. And the advantage of standalone is it's uh, more viable for um, higher education. Uh, so you could, you know, load software onto headsets and ship them out to students, which is what we have been doing. PC VR, um, one advantage is that there's a greater amount of content for PC VR. The second is that the content is usually higher quality, so better resolution. <clears throat> the downside to PC VR currently uh, is that many of the schools and universities that have PC VR have them in rooms um, somewhere in, in their institution, but they're not being utilized because of COVID-19 and because of uh, they haven't implemented uh, infection control measures. I'm trying to get our PCVR um, studio sort of up and running again with infection control measures at the college, uh, but we'll see how that goes. But the other limitation is is you've got to, you know, you may have to rotate 50, 60, 100 students through one or two PCVR setups. So standalone, in my personal opinion, is the future of virtual reality for education. <clears throat> now, in terms of, you know, how do you decide what virtual reality applications would be appropriate for learning. Obviously, uh, the one not listed here is, you know, that it, it enhances learning. It adds something to the curriculum that might have been otherwise impossible um, in analog for, um, format, rather, or in any other uh, form of educational technology. But um, Jeremy Balenson, who's the director of the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at Stanford, uh, suggests in his book, Experience on Demand, I recommend this reading if you're, if you're into VR, is that, you know, four of the things that we might think about when selecting VR is, is that it provides learning uh, that might otherwise be dangerous, impossible, counterproductive, or expensive. Um, and so uh, I think about the trades, uh, for example, there are a number of skills you can learn in virtual reality where you might be able to conceivably reduce the cost of consumables. So if you're learning woodworking, and I'll, I'll play the video, I'm pretty sure the sound doesn't come through, which is fine because I'll narrate it. Um, and in fact, I'm going to try to shut off the sound if I can. Um, hang on a second here. Oh. All right, so you can go through the procedures time and time again and learn the basic skills, the step-by-step -step processes, and the hope is that when you're in a face-to-face -face class or in a, in a lab, a woodworking class, um, you're not destroying as many consumables as you might otherwise. Sorry, I'm going to stop that video. It's... Uh, I don't think you can hear it, but it's really loud in my ears, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, so let's move to the next slide here. Um, this is another one uh, that sort of falls, oops, hang on a second here. This is uh, another application that falls under the category of, of expensive and is ideally ideal for uh, PCVR. So we have a flight services program. It's part of our hospital tourism re recreation program. And um, there are three applications that we've been looking at that are around uh, flight services safety um, to teach flight attendants how to extinguish fires with a fire extinguisher on the plane, how to open doors, how to um, um, deploy a life raft, and so on and so forth. But uh, the three applications combined cost 
$8,000 per headset per year, which is really cost prohibitive. Um, and that's because they've been selling to industry and they haven't looked at education pricing, at least not yet. I'm still talking with the company and trying to work, you know, talk them down. But um, uh, these are great applications because uh, when you when you think about it, uh, what would flight services do otherwise? What they do is they take uh, 20, 30 students and they put them on a bus or in their individual cars and they go down to Pearson Airport and uh, and they get an orientation on one of the planes. It's expensive. It's difficult to schedule. Under the current circumstances, they're not able to do it at all. Uh, but in virtual reality, they can learn it. So uh, two things happen. One, it's it may be their only source of learning for uh, for this and far superior, obviously, than, uh, you know, a video conference uh, or it's learning that supplements the hands-on learning so that they get the most of their experience when they actually do go to the airport. So let me just play this video. Good. Okay. I managed to turn the sound off at my end. <laughs> <laughs> which is a relief. Um, so yeah, you, what's what's important in virtual reality is you've, you've got agency. So when you when you appear in virtual reality, you see yourself in the form of an avatar and you see your hands in front of yourself, which are actually controllers, but you feel like they're your hands and you're able to open doors, you're able to do things with your hands. And that, that um, sort of embodied experience is really important for learning steps and procedures. So this is identifying a suspicious package on the plane. So let me just go to the next uh, set of slides here. This is another one. Um, this is uh, more flight service training, and this is from uh, on a platform called Engage VR, which is uh, a social VR platform uh, where you can run classes. And uh, this is a bit of a combination of context-based learning and role playing. So again, flight services would be using a, a platform like this. Uh, the instructor and all the students would be on the plane in virtual reality, and this is what it looks like. Now, unfortunately, you can't hear it, but these avatars are real people. And this is a student who's sort of preparing to give a debriefing on the plane. And when she opens her mouth, you can just assume she's speaking and she's giving a debriefing and showing the exits and how to secure the seat belts and, and uh, you know, what to do when the seatbelt light comes comes on and when to, when to get up and when you can go to the bathroom and, and so on. So as I said, this is a, a platform called Engage VR and we're using Engage VR uh, currently for teaching some of our classes. And those avatars you see in seats are actual students, uh, which is pretty incredible. And there's some degree of agency in this in that you can open and close cupboards and you can pick up things. Um, so there's a, it's somewhat limited, say for example, compared to the previous uh, video that I showed, uh, but really quite remarkable. Oh, hang on a second here again, there we go. Um, yeah, so um, in terms of agency, in terms of skills development, um, there's a, a company called UBSIM that develops uh, nursing, nursing skills and nursing assessments. Uh, and uh, it's quite a robust um, a series of scenarios. Um, but what's, what's most incredible about it to me in terms of skills building is that, uh, you know, for example, if you are expected to administer insulin to a patient in virtual reality, what you would do is you would you go in and see the patient, introduce yourself, and make sure you've got the right patient, uh, and then you go to the cupboard and get the things that you need, <clears throat> you know, including um, IV bags, IV administration kits, uh, the medication you need, sharps, containers, syringes, needles, uh, IV catheters, and so on. And then you bring them back to the room and you would assemble them uh, and then you would go through the procedure. So it's uh, what they call ag local agency. So you're just going through skills. And one of the advantages of virtual reality is you can practice those skills over and over again in a way that you might not get the same opportunity to, to have that repetitious practice in in a lab. And my hope 
uh, going forward is that this will reduce the learning curve uh, so students will get the most out of their lab experience. There was a study published in 2020 um, uh, where they randomized uh, medical students, second year medical students to either um, standard uh, training for a simple surgical, well, relatively sur a simple surgical procedure versus VR training. Um, and it was in collaboration with a company called Also VR. And the percentage of steps done correctly in VR versus standard was 63% versus 25%. And the retention of the instruments um, was 50% versus 11% in the standard group, which to me is quite remarkable and a good early proof of, of concept for, um, for virtual reality for skills based testing uh, and training. So um, empathy is a really interesting area for virtual reality. And if, if you want to read more about uh, the potential for um, learning empathy or experiencing empathy, learning in the affective domain, uh, I'd suggest you go to the Virtual Human Interactive Lab at Stanford University and read some of the published papers, uh, psychology papers there about empathy. So essentially, um, in virtual reality, you experience embodiment and body transfer where um, if you're uh, looking at yourself, for example, in a virtual mirror and you're a person of color uh, or an elderly person, within about four minutes, you begin to believe that that is you. You know, there's a, it's it's an illusion, obviously, and there's a you know, part of you who says, no, I'm someone different, and there's a part of you that says, okay, I think this is me, because every time I move my hand this way or that way, it's, it's, it's me that I'm seeing. And that's really powerful when you get to experience firsthand what it's like to be the victim of microaggressions, uh, or what it's like to be on the autism spectrum and experience the kinds of sounds and uh, uh, visual things that you might see on the autism spectrum or what you might experience if you had macular degeneration or dementia. There's a program um, that, that was created by Stanford University called Becoming Homeless and it's just a nine minute uh, virtual reality experience and it's really quite powerful um, and I recommend you try it if you get the chance. So in that uh, experience, you are a person who lost your job a month ago or so, and you're sitting in your apartment looking at an eviction notice and um, trying to figure out how you're going to make the rent. And so a narrator prompts you to look at the things in your apartment and, and sell off some of the things that you want to um, get rid of that get some money to make the rent and so you sell off things like your laptop and your your flat screen tv and some other things but you still can't make the rent and you end up getting evicted and you find yourself living in your car and you're sitting in your car looking around at all the food wrappers and your belongings uh, piled up in the back seat and you see flashing lights the police pulling up and you've been ticketed a numerous times and you haven't been able to pay your parking ticket and uh, the police end up impounding your car but the police officer tells you about a program in the city where homeless people can ride the public transit at night where they can sleep. And so you find yourself on this public bus and you're sitting there with your backpack next to you and the narrator warns you that there's a, a creepy guy who likes to harass homeless people and likes to steal things from you. Um, and the narrator advises you just to turn around and stare at him. And so he, he approaches you and you actually look up at him and you stare at him and after a few seconds he walks away. Um, and then you get to, uh, you can point and click at other people on the bus and learn their story about how they became homeless. And this is an actual uh, program, I can't remember what city it's in, but it was a really powerful uh, experience. And, um, you know, it, it induces empathy in a way that would be very difficult to do in a classroom discussion. In our architectural uh, technology program, um, they've been using a program called Revit for about four years now. And so essentially what they're doing is they're, they're uh, creating buildings um, on 2D, but they're also doing it in virtual reality. So imagine being uh, you know, on a piece of land and actually starting to construct buildings in virtual reality where you're choosing the appropriate materials uh, and you're uh, you know, building walls with insulation and uh, you decide, okay, that 
that ceiling's not high enough, I'm going to bump it up from seven feet to nine feet. Um, you can do all this um, in virtual reality. And the, the spatial perception or the power of that spatial perception um, in construction and design and things like um, interior design, which is another program that um, is launching a pilot this uh, this January, uh, is really uh, quite powerful, really pretty, pretty incredible. So in our biotech degree, we're also uh, launching a pilot in January where they're going to be using a program called Nanome, which allows you uh, with the uh, instructor and students to look at uh, molecules at a macro level and be able to pull proteins out and add proteins in and get down to the, uh, to the uh, atomic structures. Um, and Nanome is being used by scientists around the globe right now to study novel viruses, to design uh, new pharmaceuticals, um, and it's really quite an amazing program. They're also going to be learning chemistry in a virtual reality chemistry lab um, with a product called InSpirit VR. Uh, which was created by two Stanford graduates. And it's a free program, so they'll be in a chemistry lab uh, actually doing chemistry um, safety orientation and performing chemical experience that might otherwise be dangerous. Again, a good application of virtual reality. In terms of uh, context-based learning, um, we just launched uh, a program in our Indigenous Studies at Georgian where the Indigenous Studies students have uh, four language courses. The first semester is language in the home. So um, we brought them into uh, a virtual home in Altspace VR, which is a Microsoft product and it's free. And the students can go in and everything is labeled in there with the Anishinaabe Moin word and English word. Uh, so plates, cupboards, doors, light fixtures, uh, everything else. And we're also, uh, we've contracted a company to build a, a separate world on a piece of land for us uh, to go into Engage VR, which um, adds interactivity. So they'll be able to open cupboards and pick up plates and knives and forks and so on and so forth. And it'll give them the, uh, the Anishinaabe Moin word, English word, plus an audio file for pronunciation. Um, so there's good evidence to support uh, context-based learning uh, and an e even additional um, evidence to support interactive con uh, context-based learning for um, higher retention. So quite excited about that. We're also collaborating with some indigenous groups in the US and in Greenland right now and hoping to create uh, a global um, in, uh, virtual reality for indigenous people um, organization. In our advanced care paramedic, uh, we're going to be piloting um, a program by a company called Health Scholars uh, for pediatric resuscitation and advanced cardiac life support. This is a really interesting program uh, in that it uses voice recognition and artificial intelligence. So the student um, appears in virtual reality and they have a team of people around them and you'll notice they all have name tags and basically the student just barks out orders to them. So the student might say, you know, Aaron, can you check for pulse? Phil, can you start chest compressions? Fatima, can you start an intravenous line? Uh, Charles, can you give a milligram of uh, epinephrine? So the student has to look at the monitor, has to uh, do an assessment, a diagnosis, a treatment intervention. The other thing that's interesting about this program is that it um, uh, also evaluates your your team leadership skills and your situational awareness. So, for example, if someone's doing chest compressions, you got to watch them and make sure they don't start to slow down. And if they slow down, you have to prompt them to to compress the chest faster, or you have to swap them out for someone who's not as tired. The person who's ventilating might hypo or hyperventilate the patient, so you have to keep your eye on them as well. And there's a there's a physician, uh, an eMERGE physician by the name of Dr. Tim Cobalt out of Columbia, Missouri, who's using the same programs to train his eMERGE residents. So we've been having discussions with him and talking about uh, some research collaborations in the next year uh, with these tools. And this would be ideal for critical care nurses as well. Uh, this is uh, the social VR program I told you about, uh, which is Engage VR, and um, so this is a place where you can go as uh, you know, teachers, students, people. You can host events. You can even have um, exhibition halls, and this is a video of their exhibition hall. And what I want you to pay attention to uh, is the end of the video, which is really incredible. So, so this guy here on the right is talking about this this truck that he sells. 
and um, yeah, he's talking with this lady about this truck. And then um, he asks her, would you like to see what it looks like in real life size? And so in virtual reality, you can do that. And this could be uh, an actual scan of the truck. So you could use photogrammetry, uh, which is uh, taking thousands of pictures and stitching them all together to create a replica uh, of this thing. So let me just play this video through. So as you can see, the exhibit hall looks pretty realistic. And some of you may have attended the recent um, college fair in Verbella, which is similar. Um, it, you know, most people access Verbella in, in 2D form on a PC. And um, uh, it works quite well, except for the fair. It didn't work all that great, well, all that well. <laughs> uh, but Engage is similar, uh, except that in, in Engage, you would be in there with a, a virtual reality headset on. So here we're looking at this truck, and then he offers to show it to her in real life size. And this just kind of blows me away. Okay, it's coming. Give it a second. Way too much talking going on here. Okay, here we go. Ta da! All right. Now you could actually create this 3D object in such a way that you could actually climb those stairs and get into it. I don't think they did that for the purpose of this demonstration, uh, but that is possible. Um, I was at a session at Engage VR a few months ago where um, one of the uh, deputy chiefs for a fire department in the UK demonstrated an apartment fire and talked about uh, the arson investigation. And so there were a group of us um, in this, let me just stop this video here. There were a group of us in this space and he brought the apartment in there and he created some smoke. Um, and then we had to go through the apartment after the fire was extinguished and determine the cause of the fire. And that was incredible experiential learning uh, in my Opinion is really quite incredible. No oh, pain on there. Let's get this. Move to the next one. Um, so, our um, we're launching another pilot in January with our uh, tourism program, and uh, they'll be uh, using a program called Wander, which is essentially Google View in virtual reality, where um, teacher and three other students can get together and explore the world essentially. They'll also be using uh, National Geographic, which is another virtual reality experience, which is quite uh, quite incredible. Uh, the graphics are absolutely beautiful. Um, and uh, the last program I want to mention is our uh, veterinary technician program. I'd forgotten to include that include that in here, but we launched a pilot with that tech program uh, where the students are doing animal dissection in virtual reality using a program called Victory XR. And they're also doing an uh, bovine and canine anatomy using a, a free program, an open source program that we got from Virginia Tech University. And we just uh, Georgianized it uh, a little bit. So uh, in summary, um, we've been exploring VR in architectural technology. It's really fully immersed in there. Our biotech degree is launching a program. Uh, our change making group has been using VR for a while now. Uh, we're launching uh, pilots in tourism, events management. So event man events management is going to be using um, um, Altspace VR, Verbella, and Engage VR. Our indigenous studies I mentioned, interior design is launching a pilot. Uh, paramedic I forgot to mention. So we have two paramedic programs, our primary care paramedic uh, program. They're using PCVR or were until the apocalypse happened. Uh, they're using PCVR to do multi-casualty incident triage where the student in VR 
in paramedic avatar form would arrive at a hotel where a bus has driven through the hotel lobby, killed some people, injured some others, and they've got to eat, go to each individual casualty and assess and triage them. Our advanced care paramedic I mentioned, um, and vet tech I mentioned. Um, but uh, things being the way they are, virtual reality is not, not I'm going to work for every faculty or every program, uh, one, because of content, and two, just uh, because of the current situation we're on, uh, we're under. So, for example, in our Fire and Arts program, there's a program called uh, Tilt Brush, uh, which is a painting and sculpting uh, program, and there are a few others like it. Uh, and it's really quite beautiful. And not only is it beautiful, and not only do the students learn how to sculpt and paint in VR, and they can actually 3D print their sculptures if they wanted to, um, but it also gives them a skill set uh, that could be marketable when they graduate to marketable to VR companies um, and galleries uh, when they graduate that they would not otherwise have had. Um, we also have a, a gallery and museum program, which would be perfect for virtual reality because students can visit galleries and museums all over the world right now in virtual reality. And the photorealism of those places is just incredible. But uh, the fine arts faculty are feeling a little overwhelmed with COVID right now. And so uh, we're just going to hold off maybe until the fall or later. We'll see. So my approach has been to uh, look for off-the-shelf virtual reality products and when I find one that I find that's really compelling or maybe addresses a number of learning objectives I approach faculty and programs and say do you want to pilot this with a small cohort so we're really piloting we're exploring we're not uh, at the integration stage yet but I think this is uh, really important to to pilot and explore it in these early days because it's a truly remarkable form of of uh, hang on let me get to this for the the other one for a second in a second but it's a truly remarkable form of experiential learning and uh, Mike Wadera who's uh, writes for TechCrunch said we're we're moving from the information age to the experiential age and uh, having had the kinds of experience that I've had in virtual reality right now, I would say that's probably true. I'm not sure it's going to happen quickly, but in education, I think it's going to happen uh, fairly rapidly over the next 10 years. I just wanted to add, just to brag a little bit, we had some paramedic students who uh, did some patient assessment and treatments in virtual reality, and they did a little applied research study. Uh, small cohort, not something that, that was big enough to publish, um, and they actually presented their findings at the 2020 International VR Summit um, that was attended by over 6,000 people. And um, that that avatar there closest to you, that's me. And those are two of the students who presented uh, in that study. So with that, um, I just want to say I would encourage you to, um, if, if you're thinking at all about virtual reality, you can connect with me and we can uh, set up a conversation, have a discussion around it. But I would encourage you to, to explore it and think about uh, whether it's sound pedagogy. And um, uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. And I'm going to go back to uh, uh, the chat session here. That's great. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Rob. So I've been tracking the questions. Yeah, and, okay. Uh, I, I'm going to fire them off at you, okay? Yep. Uh, so just, uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for the for the presentation. The, the chat room has been buzzing. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, uh, my name is Mark Enad. I'm the um, uh, Director of Digital Learning at Humber College and the Chair of the ETC uh, group. Uh, and Gina started this session and has left, and I'm carrying on. So. Uh, as the questions, as Rob presented and as the questions came in, I have been tracking them. So I'm going to put them out there, then I'll take yep. my mic off and I'll give you a chance, uh, chance to respond. So the first question that came in um, was, are you using uh, some of this technology right now with nursing? Uh, they are using 2D simulation right now. Uh, but I've, I've looked at some really compelling um, virtual reality applications for nursing. There's a company called SimXR, and I'll just type it in the chat here, or SimX. Um, they have a large number of scenarios. Their, their scenarios are designed for physicians and nurses primarily, and uh, the instructor can sort of control the patient much, way, much the way you would a high fidelity simulator from a laptop. And um, it's really, really quite interesting. Um, UBSim is another one. Uh, 
but UBSIM is PCVR, which is has its restrictions, and uh, they have a limited number of scenarios. There's another program, and uh, some of the nursing faculty in here might be familiar with it. It's called uh, PCS Spark, and it's an interesting one. So it uses voice recognition and artificial intelligence where you have a client sitting in front of you, let's say, in a hospital room, and she presents with a headache. You can go through an entire history with her, ask her about, you know, when, when did the headache start, where is it located, how bad is it, does it does it radiate anywhere? Um, what were you doing at the time when it started? Is it constant? Does it come and go? How would you describe it? Um, and then you can ask about medical history, meds, and allergies. Um, and um, I'm really excited about that particular type of technology because uh, one of the things that's a challenge in paramedicine and nursing and other health disciplines is to help students develop those history taking skills and those communication skills. So, uh, so there are lots of good applications. And in my slides, when I share the slides, I think here's a here's a link to my slides. There's a link in there to uh, a couple of hundred applications, many of which are patient simulations. So you can go through those. That's great. Thank you. Uh, now, some of these questions were answered in the chat room, so I'm, I'm making some okay, sure. uh, objective decisions around. Uh, so, what, so Lynn brought up a concern about Oculus 2 and, it, and, and wondering if you had any feedback on this or the group. Um, that what headsets are folks looking at since the Oculus 2 has had some recent privacy issues slash nightmares? Uh, yeah, so, you know, <laughs> I was thinking uh, whether I should uh, put a slide in there about the dark side of virtual reality. Uh, cause <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> cause, yeah, yeah, because there is a dark side. So, um, yeah, the Facebook login requirement for the Quest 2 is definitely one of the dark sides. So, so the Oculus Quest is probably the best standalone headset on the market right now. And I recommend getting it and looking at it and trying it. Uh, it's definitely worthwhile. But it does require a Facebook login. So we're launching four pilots right now. And um, um, I was going to hold off. We, we were going to sort of put our pilots on hold. But uh, our senior management went to our board of governors and they had a discussion around. They said, well, these are pilots. Why don't we get students who would be willing to volunteer to try virtual reality and to use their their personal Facebook login to do it. So, so that's what we're doing. And, um, but the hope is, um, so this is really early days. The virtual uh, reality headset makers have not come up with an education model. They have an enterprise model where the, uh, the headsets are very expensive and the multi-device management system that IT would normally use to put uh, software on and take software off is, is expensive, in most cases cost prohibitive for us. Uh, but we're hoping they're going to come up with an education model. I've been speaking with uh, senior managers in the policy department for Facebook Oculus, uh, and they're really eager to create a fa uh, sorry an education division and uh, eager to work with educators. Uh, so I'm hopeful they'll come up with a viable and affordable uh, model for sure. Um, I mean, the other dark side to uh, virtual reality is in social VR platforms, where you're moving around. If you're sitting in a chair and you're using a joystick to move your avatar, your avatar is moving, but you're physically not moving, the conflict between those two things creates motion sickness for a lot of people. Uh, and uh, so there are some ways to mitigate that. Um, one of the ways is uh, before you push your joystick to move forward, you can close your eyes, move, you know, push your joystick, stop, and then open your eyes again. Another way is to teleport where you press a button and you sort of aim at the place where you want to go and you just sort of pop over there. Um, but yeah, that's that's a problem, a hurdle we, uh, that VR has not overcome yet. Now, in other programs, for example, like in, in if you were in uh, nano VR or doing a surgical procedure, you might be standing up and actually walking around or in Simex where you're doing patient simulation or patient assessment and treatment, you might actually be physically walking around. So you, um, so there's no conflict there and uh, people tend not to experience a dizziness under those experiences. Um, and I could go on and on about the dark side. The other, you know, there's data there's lots of data that that's uh, collected in virtual reality. There's analytics, which is the positive is, is you can evaluate your students using those analytics. Uh, there's photorealism, um, but you can take advantage of some of the things like data analytics and photorealism. So, for example, in medical simulation, you probably want a high level of photorealism. You want your patient to look 
really sick or really badly injured. And you can use that to your advantage in the sense that you can start nurses and paramedics and other healthcare providers at, with low acuity patients and scaffold sort of build up the level of acuity and, and the criticality of the call so that they um, build some, um, some stress resilience. Uh, so you could use biometrics for that as well, like pulse and pupillary changes. Uh, you can also use biometrics to check where, check where people look, which can be really valuable uh, in training. But um, there's a dark side to that as well. Great question and great response. Thank you. So the questions keep coming Thanks. in. We'll do the best we can. So okay, sure. Uh, Adib had a question about WebXR. Great yep. talk. I'm curious if WebXR is on your radar at all. This would allow everyone to access VR or AR experiences through any device that can be that can access a web browser, PC, smartphone, virtual reality headsets, and so on. Yeah, bang on. WebXR is uh, is really exciting, and I think um, hopefully it'll be the future, especially with 5G and eventually 6G. Uh, WebXR will be will be uh, the, the best sort of platform for most things because it'll be um, headset agnostic. Um, the downside is if you're living in a rural remote area and you still don't have high-speed internet and uh, you know um, Elon Musk's um, uh, Wi-Fi hasn't come to your region yet, then uh, WebXR may not uh, be viable. But um, yeah, I think it's definitely going to play a big role in the future. Thank you. Um, so we're getting, I'm going to combine some of these questions because obviously, sure. you know, VR and extended reality in general requires funding, support, uh, yeah. you know, ac academic uh, leadership and support at that level as well. So let's say you can't do the headset. Let's say, you, you, you know, you're limited in, in terms of what you have in terms of resources. Mm -hmm. Which, how do you get into this? Which of these platforms allow you, for example, to manipulate an avatar from a browser alone? Yeah. Where's the end? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and that's that's a super great question. So as educators, we have to think about equity, right? Uh, and not everyone is going to have access to a headset, and not everyone is going to feel good physically in a headset. So ideally, any program you're going to be using, there should be a PC or Mac version of it. Uh, so Altspace VR, for example, um, our Indigenous study students are in there. We're in there this morning, actually. I was in there with them, and they're in this virtual home. And some of them um, didn't, you know, have not tolerated the headset all that well. They're getting used to it, and you you do acclimatize, but um, they've got PC PC access or Mac access as well. Uh, so same with the Gauge VR. And uh, so whenever you know I look or we look at different virtual reality experiences, ideally there has to be a PC or Mac version of it as well. So for uh, for accessibility. So yeah, it's a great point. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have another uh, question, another question from Win. Uh, sorry, Lynn. When you pilot these systems, are you just arranging the software use, or are you also helping with the equipment? So I guess this is really a support question. Where does how where does it begin and end in terms of making sure that a project of this ilk kind of can see itself right to the end? Yeah, well, so currently it's a it's a huge challenge. So when we had the uh, the original quest, uh, what we did was all those quests would go to um, someone in our IT department who would load software. Like not all software can be accessed through the Oculus Store, for example, or through Vive Port using the the HTC Vive, and so our our IT guy would sideload uh, those applications, which which involves putting the headset into developer mode and uh, um, uh, using a program called SideQuest or some other company's side-loading software and then loading it on, you know, through the, through the back door, if you will, or the side door, and then knowing where to find it once you're in the Oculus headset or whatever headset you happen to be used. Um, and um, in an ideal world, um, we would, IT would be able to load and unload programs using a multi-device management system, and that's where we have to go. I would say once you get about 50 headsets or more in your college or university, um, it, it becomes unmanageable unless you've got a multi-device management system. So right now, to Lynn's point, it's a, it's a, uh, even more of a nightmare because we have this Facebook login requirement for the Oculus Quest 2. And, and that means that not only do students have to use their own Facebook account, but I have to give them instructions on um, how to download a particular software to their computer, how to link their headset to their computer and sideload stuff. Uh, they have to even create a developer account. Uh, it is 
it is a nightmare. There's no question about it. And I've been whining and complaining to Oculus Facebook and, um, you know, Vive and Pico Neo 2, these are other headsets. Uh, they're, they're not much better um, because they have other issues, lack of content and uh, so on. It's not as good a quality headset. So um, it's, it's a nightmare right now. So if you're going... Uh, if you were interested in piloting right now, I would say, you know, talk to me and uh, start small. <laughs> uh, that's good. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned earlier on the OCIF, the, um, the information fair, and you hinted that it didn't go well. And not everyone in this uh, session um, attended that, the OCIF. So they're wondering what, what didn't go well, why didn't it go well? And, and if that's the case, and we're talking about moving forward into more extended reality experiences. If we can't get it right with OCIF, what does that say in terms of the, in terms of the next steps in the future? Yeah, so um, the event overall, I think, uh, went really well. It was a great, great event, uh, but um, it was glitchy. I went in there two or three times, and every time I tried to teleport into another room, um, it kept crashing on me. Now, having said that, uh, we're using Verbella at Georgian College, and I've had no glitches. And I went to uh, a three-day event, the Immersive Technology, um, sorry, uh, Immersive Learning uh, Research Network. They held a three-day event, and there were like two or three thousand people there, and it wasn't glitchy at all. So I'm not sure what happened. I think they might have had just had one, you know, bad experience with uh, with that event, unfortunately. Uh, but otherwise, the event was uh, extremely well organized, and there were some great sessions in there. So um, it was just the 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 platform they're using for whatever reason was glitchy uh, during that event. Perfect. Thank you. I, I think I've covered. I've merged, as it says. I, I combined some of the questions. So I think I've covered all the questions. So. I'm going to, we're at 1251. I'm going to leave it now open to the chat room. If you have anything you'd like to ask now, I believe Rob can see the chat room now that his presentation is done. Yep. Um, please post your question. And uh, so let's just leave it for 30 seconds or so, see if any more questions come in. And then we can, and we'll take it from there. Oh, Eva from Humber has asked, have you ever uh, used spatial.io? Uh, yes, I have. Yeah, it's very cool. H have you used it? I haven't, uh, and okay. I I have, right. oh, yeah, can, can I so, speak? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for it. I know that we're working on a project with Hololens and Spatial IO, but that's where yeah. the early stages. So go for yeah. it, Eva. Uh, well, our associate dean is sort of actively looking for ways to have more virtual interaction, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, this was she's ha having me help her research this. I've actually tried to reach out to Spatial. I haven't received an email back, but and and I think they're 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 looking into buying a few Hollow Lens two uh, sets. Um, but uh, have you used it? Have you used Spatial? Yeah, I've used it in virtual reality and augmented reality. I have yeah. uh, I have a Hollow Lens two in my office here, my home office. Um, and yeah, it's very cool. It's uh, you're basically in avatar form, and if you're holding a meeting, you can walk up to a whiteboard and draw on it and do things, and you can bring 3D objects in there. Uh, I mean, you know, part of the trouble trouble with augmented reality is a Hololens 2, for example, is eight thousand dollars Canadian per headset, uh, compared with let's say three hundred and ninety nine dollars for an Oculus Quest headset. Um, so, uh, but. Augmented reality glasses are going to come down in price. Uh, they're going to become ubiquitous at some point. Uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's a nice program, and it's just. But you just can a, use spatial without. Uh, you can use a uh, like a um, Oculus or something if you don't want the AR function, right? Yep, yep. You can use it in VR or AR, yeah. and I think on 2D screens as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Tony is here, and he's used it quite a bit, I believe. Um, and someone else. Uh, Thayer merits, or if I'm saying it wrong, but uh, he's uh, that person okay, yeah. saying that they've used it. Yeah, I just I would just yep. wanted to get some like feedback from people who have actually used it, and if that would be something, you know, how would you compare it to Verbella? I have I, this is the question I've heard about. Yeah, so well, well, Verbella is um, is pretty intuitive and. Um, you know what I would suggest? I would definitely suggest exploring for Bella. Um, and um, we, 
we use the uh, Immersive Learning Research Network for Bella Campus. Uh, we partnered with iLearn because they're, they're a not-for-profit organization and their pricing is a little bit better and they're also very interested in how educators use uh, sort of, um, um, you could call it 2D learning, some people call it 2.5D because you, you land on a campus in avatar forum and it's a a little bit more immersive than uh, a video conference, but not as immersive as a VR headset. Um, so I, I would encourage exploring Verbella. It's got some great features. And what I one of the things I love about Verbella is that the students can go into, um, there, there are these glowing blue circles around tables. And when you pop into them, you you have a private conversation. And um, Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, they can use sticky notes. Uh, they can use whiteboards. Um, uh, there are all sorts of really interesting things they can do. Can you build your own things as well in Verbella or have them build? So I think you can uh, bring um, 3D uh, objects into Verbella. I think you just have to talk with uh, the company about that okay. and uh, I'm not sure how that works exactly. Thank you and, so much. Uh, sure, no problem. To answer uh, Adib's question, I haven't used Wanda VR. Uh, but that looks interesting. Well, that's great. Uh, great question, Eva. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're all battling with the same, you know, similar, similar circumstances and obstacles, right? The interest level is absolutely there with any kind of extended reality experience. Mm -hmm. The desire from the students is there. The desire from faculty is there, is there in terms of building content, making those immersive points it's all about that entry point right what what's going to work how can we get into that marketplace how can we find the funding for that marketplace or for that for that for those experiences and the return on that investment you know the subtle side of it how is it going to impact learning and is it going to do what we want it to do and i think many of the colleges uh have dabbled in, in a variety of ways in extended reality and with some success and with some not so successful experiences so there's so much exciting work to be done and um, you've done a really nice job. Thank you very much for for uh, laying this out for the group in terms of some of the, the, the pieces that you and your team are doing and, and will continue to work on. So that's really great. So Pleasure. virtual round of applause. You're getting lots of thank yous and, and great presentations in the chat room. So virtual round of applause to Rob. Um, and um, as Gina mentioned at the start of the session, uh, we have three more webinars coming up. If you go to edtechontario.ca, you can see the upcoming schedule. You'll also see the recording of this session and uh, the slides. Uh, I wanted to thank everyone who, who came today, thank our present uh, pr presenter, thank all those who intended. This has been wonderful. And I believe Rob has even put his email in the, uh, in the chat room if you want to reach out to him directly and, and talk about some of the pieces that he talked about today. So thank you to the attendees. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I'm going to now stop recording and oh, and the link for his Google slides are in there. So in yep. the chat. So thanks everyone. Thank Have you. a wonderful day. We thanks, look forward to at our future webinars. Thanks so much, Rob. Thank you.